it's time for your outspoken emails to be heard. This is Rapid Fire. All right, folks, it's time now for Rapid Fire. This is where I take your emails that you send us, I read them on the air, and I have 30 seconds to answer each question. Let's get started with question number one. Dear Steve, this is a really dumb question. Uh, no, never. There are no dumb questions, but I'll continue. But I would think that others would be wanting to know this as well. What is a mutual fund and how does it work? Signed, Mildred M. from Conway. Start the clock. Mildred, that's an excellent question. Mutual funds, the word mutual basically describes it. It talks about people that have a mutual objective. If, if several people want to have growth in their investments, they pool their money together and a fund manager buys growth investments and he might buy 300 different companies. That's a growth mutual fund. So you're sharing with other people and you can own 300 shares of, a, of companies without having to pay to buy each one individually. So it really helps. All right, number two. Dear Steve, I want to save for my son's college expense. There's a lot of information on how to do this. And the most popular one is called the 529 plan. What is your opinion on this plan? Or what would you suggest is better? I appreciate your show. Shannon G. in North Little Rock. Shannon, I appreciate your question. Start the clock. Uh, yes, there are 529 plans. And let me just say this in the limited amount of time I have. If you're going to do a 529 plan, do it through the state because you can get a tax deduction. It's a state tax deduction, but you get a tax deduction for contributing to a 529 plan. The other way might be just to put it in a, in a custodial account or just put it in a regular account, but it won't grow tax free as it would in a 529 plan because if you use that money for college, all the gain, gain and all the growth is tax free. So use the stake, get the tax deduction, and then use it for college, get tax free. Moving on, uh, Mr. Kiefer, my wife and I have retirement plans and we haven't changed any of the investments for a long time. We would like to update our investments, but don't know what to do. They offer something called target funds, which has something to do with our retirement horizon date. What is your opinion on these kinds of funds? Signed, Joel P. in Sherwood. Joel, awesome question, target funds. My goodness, this is the, the answer to people. The, the, the corporation said, we're gonna try and help you with your 401k by coming up with target funds. They'll set a date like uh, 2010, 2015, 2020, and you pick the date you think you're gonna retire and you invest in that. And they're gonna allocate those funds based on that date of retirement that you picked. Sounds good so far, but folks, I'm telling you, this is one of the worst investment decisions you can make is investing in a target fund. I know we're out of time, but I'm gonna break the rules here because I gotta finish with this one, folks. Here's the problem. If you say you're gonna retire in 2010, you're gonna retire next year, and you put all your money in that, that is going to be the most conservative investment that 401k or 403b can come up with. The TSP has their L funds, but here's the problem. You've just gotten extremely ultra conservative and you've got 30 years of retirement ahead of you. That's like having a gas station a mile away and you're coasting, you're out of gas, but if you leave things alone, you'll make it. But you start tapping the brakes. That's what would happen if you got into a target fund and wrote it out. You'll have investments that are paying interest and have no equity exposure, which means you can't stay up with inflation and you could very easily run out of money. So my answer is, in 30 seconds plus, don't use target funds. All right, we'll get back on track now. Steve, my grandmother gave us a $50 savings bond on our birthday while we were growing up. I've always remembered that and wanted to do the same for my grandchild. I am thinking of giving more than 50, but is there another way or a better way? Thank you, Robert C. and BB. Start the clock. Robert, great question. Uh, that was kind of the way to do it back then, and it's a, it's a nice feel-good thing. But if you really want to do something for your grandchild and make them some money, put it into a good, low-cost, growth mutual fund. And I can tell you that child, uh, if they have 10, 15, 20 years before they need it, it's going to make them a whole lot more money than a savings bond will. So the savings bond for feel good, but a mutual fund for doing good financially. That will really be the best route for you to go. folks. I've enjoyed this rapid fire time. We've had some good, good questions and I want you to keep sending those questions. Robert, tell them how they can do it. If you have an investment question or comment you would like answered on air, send those emails to rapidfire at you, me, and wallstreet.com. So folks, are we facing a new world order? 
with investments? Have we stepped into a new paradigm where the old ways of investing are now obsolete? That's what experts are saying. And here's what they're saying. Buy and hold no longer works. Buying an investment and just holding it through thick and thin doesn't work anymore. And they've based those conclusions on the recent downturn in the market, 2008. So they've taken one year of historical information and they've concluded that everything we've learned about investing is now worthless. Throw it out the window. When we have centuries of proof that buy and hold works. Even before there was a market, a stock market or any type of market, people would buy land and they would send, pass it down from generation to generation. It would grow by a thousand percent in value because they held on to the property and eventually some generation sold it. They paid, they, they made so much more than what their great, great, great grandparent bought it for. So let's see if their wisdom is accurate. Let me start with drawing you a little chart here. And let's look at some historical things. You know, I like historical numbers because numbers just do not lie. So you can't fudge on them. If it, this is the number that history provides, then that's the way it is. First, we're going to look at a market crisis. So we're going to, I'm going to give you different crisis moments in history that the market went through. And then we're going to look at people that sold. Now, obviously, if they say buying and holding is no longer valid, what they're saying is, you have to buy and sell. So I'm going to look at that category and we're going to see how well they do. And of course the next would be what about people that hold on? What about people that do keep buying and holding? Uh, that Are they fools? Because that's so outdated? That's so yesterday? We'll find out. The next category is what if they not only hold but they add? What if they buy and hold and they add money to it? Let's find that out too. And then finally, where will they be one year from the bottom? So we'll look at the crisis. We'll look at what happens when you sell, when you hold, when you add, and where you come out a year later. Now why don't we start with the most famous crisis in the market that we all know, and that's the Great Depression. And it went really from 1928 to 1936. It, it went a little longer than, than some people realize. If you sold out at the bottom, on average, you lost 78% of your money. Now, if you held, which you really shouldn't do according to these experts, it took 48 months for you to make all of your money back. So if you sold, you lost about 78% of your value. If you just held and did nothing else, in four years, you made all of your money back. But it doesn't stop there. Let's say you added an equal amount. What you put in here, say $50,000, and you added another $50,000 here, your recovery would be three months. Think about that, folks. Think of the impact. The Great Depression, the great market crash, if you would have put an equal amount of money in, uh, equaling what you originally put in, when the market hit bottom, you would have recovered everything in three months. And where would you be one year later? One year from the bottom of the Great Depression, you would have a gain of 137%. Wow, I could stop right there and prove that buying and holding still works, but I'm not done yet. Let's take World War II. World War II, another crisis. If you sold out, you lost 31% if you hit bottom and got out. If you just held on nine months, nine months, you made all your money back. You're back at even. If you added the equal amount again, you would cut your recovery down to four months with an equal investment. And where would you be one year from the bottom of the market, you would have made 64%. Much shorter downtime, but a tremendous